the last month doesn't say he needs me to help him turn the 300 pound table over. <laughs> it was right before we started. He's like, mom, I need you to help me right now. So that's what I'm doing. Liz Wiseman, you're coming off an amazing uh, month of having your new release, I think, being on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list for three to four weeks. Congratulations. Yeah. And it's got, thank you for sending me the, the actual Wall Street Journal. Like I, I, I got that all framed in my office. I have another one to send you. I, I have the final week. I think I say it. I, one of those last humans that still gets the print newspaper delivered to my home. So I saved them for Liz and mailed them in the mail. Like I didn't know mail. anyone still did that. So I was like, man, it's good to have friends who still read paper. Yeah. So it's been a busy, busy, busy couple months, but it's great. It's great to be done with the book and have it out in the world. It's like, you kind of feel like it's not my responsibility anymore. Okay, so just a little bit of housekeeping here before we get started. So I'm James from Book Club, and we are joined today uh, by a multitude of guests. I will introduce them in a, in a moment, but just so everyone knows, this conversation is being recorded and streamed to YouTube as well. Um, so um, don't worry if you're if you want to turn your camera off or not. It's totally fine. Feel comfortable um, to your comfort level. So I will get started in introducing everyone here. First, we have the lady of the hour, Ms. Liz Wiseman. She is a New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestseller. Um, she is also the CEO of the Wiseman Group, a leadership research and development firm headquartered in Silicon Valley, California. She has conducted significant research in the field of leadership and collective intelligence and writes for the Harvard Business Review. Fortune and a variety of other, of other business and leadership journals. Um, so quite a lot there. And she is a frequent guest lecturer of BYU and Stanford University. And also she is the October selection of book club um, on the Effective Leadership Book Club um, led by Frankie Covey. Next, we have Scott Miller, who is the official host for the book club and Frankie Covey Effective Leadership Book Club. He is also a best-selling author himself and a host of a multitude of things. He's also the former CMO and EVP of Thought Leadership at Franklin Covey. And he was recruited by Dr. Stephen R. Covey's team. And Scott has built a tremendous career of being the most respected and influential leadership um, development firm um, with Franklin Covey. And then next, we have our guest moderators. Mr. Colin Hughes and Ms. Isabella de Guzman um, from BYU. They are, are serving on the BYU Student Alumni uh, Leadership Board. And another fun fact about this is also the alum of Ms. Liz Wiseman um, and also myself. So a lot of BYU alum here. They kind of have matching eyeglasses. Have you noticed that? That was that. Was that coincidental? The branding thing. I got it, Colin. Isabella. Okay, so I will kick it over then to Colin and Isabella to take it from here. And we have uh, some questions that they've gathered from the audience before this. And then also they will be collecting um, questions from people that want to speak here. So Colin and Isabella, take it away. Sounds great. Well, Liz and Scott, thanks so much for being here. Um, Awesome to be talking to both of you. Um, Liz, great to talk to uh, another BYU person. Thank you so much for your involvement at BYU. We had you at the summit a couple of years ago and, and uh, you just also received a really well-deserved university award. So congratulations. Um, awesome to have you here. Um, I'm so glad to be here. And I'm glad to be here with Scott Miller who has written so many books and is just like one of my favorite people and a pretty incredible thought partner. Now he were, he has read a gazillion books. He interviews people on their books, but this man has an iron trap memory. So he's all, he's like someone you could kind of ask about any book out there and he'll remember it. So I don't want to put any pressure on you, Scott, but um, I'm, I'm glad to be joined by Scott. Thank you, Liz. Awesome. And uh, I've, I've read Multipliers. It's an amazing book. Um, would highly recommend it to anyone who hasn't read it. But Liz, I, you know, I'm, I'm curious, you, you said you started to develop this idea of multipliers. What, what sort of drove you to turn this idea into 
you know, a big research project and eventually, you know, this, this amazing book. You know, it's funny. I didn't really start out with this idea that I was going to write a book. It really started out. I mean, this was all my post-Oracle therapy. Like, so just to be clear, you know, I joined this rapidly growing software company right out of BYU. It was this wild ride, you know, got thrown into management, just had this amazing experience. And so when I left, it felt like, like there was too much calm and it gave me a lot of time to reflect and to think and like, kind of like, what was that experience I just had? And, you know, for those of you who have gone to BYU, like you leave college and suddenly you're like, what was that? Or some people who leave missions and they get home and they're like, what just happened? That's kind of how I felt. And I was doing a lot of sense making about this experience. And like, is this normal, this experience I just had? Do other people like give people jobs that they don't know how to do? Do other companies throw people into management when they're children? And, you know, do other companies have these kind of leaders who either were like so easy to be brilliant around but leaders that like people cower around because I worked there, like it was my only real job after college. And so a lot of it was sense-making and I'm out coaching. I'm encountering all these other leaders who are struggling to get beyond their own intelligence, like so smart, so capable, but can't see really what's going on around them. And I'm like, man, I need answers to this. And I actually went out, looked in Harvard Business Review. I'm Googling things nobody's written this up and I'm looking for resources to help me be a good coach and no one's got answers. And I'm like, well, someone needs to research this. And it was really my kind of my Oracle training, a little bit of my BYU training, which is like, well, it's like nobody. And if you went to BYU, you know exactly what this is like. It's like arriving at an event and nobody has set up the chairs yet. And you're like, well, I guess somebody better set the chairs up. And so I'm like, nobody's done the research. Well, I guess I need to do this. And yeah, there's at least an article, if not a book in this, but it was more like, it just needs to get done. It was a chore. What did the, what did the initial process look, then, look like? Like, how did you assemble your research team? What were those kind of first steps you took to sort of move things off the ground? Well, the, the unfortunate, so fortunately I had read a lot of Jim Collins book uh, books. I had, hired him as a um, consultant author into some of the work we were doing at Oracle. So I'm like, what would Jim Collins do? You know, hmm, he would do a comparison study on this. And so I just Jim Collins did. And um, sometimes my, we, have, we share the same publisher here by coincidence. And sometimes my publisher says, oh, you Jim Collins this. And, and so I'm like, okay, well, I need to figure out the difference between these. How do I hold certain variables constant? And I went out and interviewed successful professionals. So I went out to people who had had a number of years experience in the workforce and asked them to tell me about, not about, tell me about a multiplier or a diminisher. It's kind of loaded. I said, tell me about a leader who, around whom you were like this, smart, big, capable, hard problems are getting solved. And then, you know, tell me all about that. What did they do? How did they think? What did it seem like they assumed? What effect did it have on you? How much of your capability did this leader get from you? And then I interviewed them around that, did a survey as follow-up. And then the same thing, tell me about someone around whom you held back. Like hard problems weren't getting solved. Like you knew the answer, but you couldn't kind of get to the answer. And then I aggregated all that and built the model. Um, and it was funny. Um, one of my hopes was someone said, what do you hope happens with this book? I'm like, well, honestly, what I really hope is that I hope someday, like Jim Collins sends me a note and just says, good job. And it actually happened one day. I got an email. It was from Jim Collins' assistant and I had mailed him a book. I didn't say, please, Jim, would you write me a note and say like, you know, well done, young lady. I just sent him a book and I got an email that his assistant said, oh, you know, I need your address. Jim has a note that he wants to send to you. And so it's a little bit of a treasure. I just wanted it, him to tell me he liked the research. Yeah. That's how did it feel when, when you got that note? Like, what was your feeling in that moment? Well, it, you feel, um, it's like that feeling when you get that sense, like, well done, like, well done, thou good and faithful servant. 
that's what it felt like. It's a quiet moment. It was a private moment, but it was like, I did, I did the right thing. I did a good thing. That's awesome. That's awesome. Kind of going along with that, that's such a special and unique opportunity and experience that you're able to have. And how did um, conducting this research have an impact on you personally? And have you seen that that impact change over um, the course of time since you first published this book? Well, I mean, it's great to have a set of ideas out there and to have made a contribution to my profession and to leaders. But I tell you, probably the biggest impact it's had on me is like, you know what? I don't really get to be a diminisher anymore. Like, I didn't really anticipate that. Like, I'm like, man, I... I was speaking at an event and I hear from across the like auditorium, it was like sort of backstage. It was Brene Brown. And some of you are probably familiar with Brene and her work. And she's just like, Hey, Liz, you're the multipliers lady. Like I read your book. I like it. She's waving to me. I'm like, Oh yeah, I'm the multipliers lady. So guess who doesn't get to be a great big diminisher. And it has caused me to be a lot more reflective. It's caused me to pause and go, oh yeah, my knee jerk reaction to that is to like be overbearing, micromanaging, like, like let my inner tyrant sort of out. And it makes me stop and go, yeah, I can't really do that. Which, you know, is sort of a bad deal. But it's, it's like a good accountability point for me. And I, I think the thing, um, you know, I've been able to see people's lives change. And I've been able to see people um, transform their leadership. I've seen whole teams transform. I've seen people's lives at work made better. But I think the moments that have been the, um, the best in seeing transformation is when people come up to me and say, um, Hey, you know what you came, you spoke here a year ago and it's changed me as a parent. And there was one particular moment I was in the UAE, um, United Arab Emirates and, um, a man from Saudi, he came up to me and, you know, this is a, a cultural situation where we're not even allowed to shake hands. And there's a certain degree of, um, discomfort even in the conversation. And he's like, you know, I heard you speak a year ago. And it has changed me as a parent, like it's forever changed me. I'm not a better leader. I'm a better father as a result of this. And like, those are really tender moments. And I think the thing that has been most delightful and surprising to me is the association with other authors. And, you know, it's not a, a secret that I just love working with Scott Miller. We have such fun conversations. He's one of the treasures in my work life. And um, I've been able to meet and associate with some pretty cool people, some really very, very smart, uh, insightful people. Please note that Liz Wiseman used the words Brene Brown and Scott Miller in the same answer, just for the record there. Completely. <laughs> Hardly. <laughs> Love it. So, would Brene so, say that oh, you ahead. were her evil twin or would that just be me? Who no, would Brene who? Who's this Brene person again? Sorry, Colin. <laughs> I got her new books. It, would it make you a little bit jealous, Scott, if I told you? Jealous? I saw you on social media last night flaunting that in its custom box. Oh, I saw it all, Liz Wiseman. Oh, you saw that? I was just I flaunting that. And I'm hoping you would you. like... Colin, you've lost control. Look at this. Liz okay, Wiseman I'm back. I'm back. Copy <laughs> I'm back. Brene Brown's book that isn't even re uh, released yet. Yeah, you're in the presence of greatness right now. <laughs> Awesome. So Liz, Liz and Scott, this is for both of you. Um, you know, speaking of, of multipliers and kind of the influence that this ideology has had on you, um, you know, for both of you, who have been sort of the biggest multipliers in your life? Like who, what great multipliers have influenced you? Well, I can answer that. Awesome. So this is going to sound really convenient, but it's, it's Liz Wiseman. Um, let me tell you why. So Liz Wiseman wrote this book that I think many people think, oh, I'm just going to become a multiplier. But the real big idea behind Liz's book isn't that you're, you know, either a multiplier or you're a diminisher. We're all on this journey of recognizing when we are accidentally diminishing people. And what does that look like and feel like and sound like to you and to them? The more you can acknowledge that, the more you can create more multiplying moments. It isn't you are this or you are that. You're kind of always both, hopefully. 
less of one, more of another. That was a big aha for me. Uh, Liz and I have spent a lot of time together. I spent 30 years of my life in the leadership development industry, both as a leader and writing about leadership and failing at it. I think the most profound thing that I've learned from Liz and how she's multiplied me is know when to play big and when to play small. I have a very big personality, a lot of charisma. I cast a big shadow metaphorically. And Liz has taught me that when, when you are an axle diminisher, like I am in the first tendency, she calls the idea fountain, right? With a lot of creative talent, a lot of energy as a CMO. I always think my job is to have the big idea and the big solution and have a whole, you know, you want watches, you want knives, what do you want? I got a solution for everything. And a few months ago, the CEO of Franklin Covey stepped aside and became the chairman of the board. And I told this to Liz. My usual style is to, you know, come into the ballroom with a thousand people and kind of take over and, and you know, have all kinds of different tchotchkes and gifts and, 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 and cards and things and balloons. And I'm bigger and better than everything. I tend to have a, you know, if I can't win, I don't come. Too often I make it about me. And I don't mean to diminish other people, but if, if my ego is such that I kind of like to make it about me a lot. And I think if people are self-aware. Some people are like that. And I'm a sociopath. It means I'm an axle diminisher. And Liz has taught me when to play big and when to play small. And it was in this going away party for the CEO where I easily could have stolen the show and people would have expected it from me. I held back. I let the team do their job. I showed up, shook his hand, took my photo, and sat down. And it was because Liz taught me when to play big and sometimes when to play small, when to you know, leave the meeting early, when to start the meeting, turn it over to the genius in the room, and go make some phone calls and come back. And Liz has been a multiplier in my life for teaching me sometimes, Scott, your strengths when overplayed can become your weaknesses. And what I think is multiplying is sometimes diminishing. Liz has exponentiated my self-awareness. Long story, but before Liz held up her self-serving sign with her name on it, she was my multiplier. I didn't do that. You're right. I made it up. You don't have any proof that I did that. I don't. Oh, oh, it's recorded, Liz Wise. It's recorded. recorded. Yeah. Um. But that's a great, it's, it's just, it's, it's one of the many nuggets Liz teaches in this book beyond, you know, are you a multiplier? How do you do that? Which of the nine diminishers are you? There's so many practical leadership takeaways. I never understood the concept of playing small. It doesn't mean shrink. It doesn't mean don't share your ideas. It doesn't mean, you know, don't contribute. Just know when, when. Hmm. Yeah, I want to I kind of go back at Scott. I, I'll mention a few other multipliers in my life, but there's something that, you know, Scott will say, oh, I have these diminishing tendencies because I have sort of a big personality. And this is true. And, and I've just been so proud watching like that play big, play small. Like we're, you know, we're like kind of taught like be consistent and the best leaders aren't consistent. Like they know when to go big with a big idea, a big challenge, a big question, but they also know how to retreat and create space for other people. And Scott has very much done that. Um, but Scott likes to talk up his diminishing tendencies and his accidental diminishing tendencies. But I want to share a conversation I had with um, the current CEO of Franklin Covey just a few weeks ago. I'm like, yeah, you know, Scott's a big talker about his diminishing tendencies, but I don't know anyone who champions other people's ideas, capability, and work the way Scott does. Like this ability to be a contributor, an author, uh, a thinker in the space, but to be able to focus on other people's work, like nobody does this better than Scott. And he has, you know, there's one of the things that we find that multiplier leaders do really well. And it's like, it, you know, in some ways, like you can kind of skip the book, skip the book club discussion in some ways. And like, I can boil this down to like two words. It's taken me a long time to do this, but what the best leaders do is they create these conditions of, of safety and stretch and they put them side by side, which is like safety for people to speak up, to tell the truth, to speak truth to power, to take risks, to feel like I belong here. It's all those kinds of safety that we hear, you know, very much talked about right now, but they also create a sense of discomfort, like that the status quo isn't okay. And one of the things that Scott has done for me over the last few years is like raised my sights about, you know what, 
go big with this. Think big. Let's, you know, like be big with these ideas. And it's this kind of stretch that I need. And for me, all of my multipliers, um, like I don't need a lot of safety. I'm one, which is like, you give me an ounce of like safety. Just tell me you're not going to like, you know, you know, kill me in a meeting and I'm going to speak up. It's like how I was raised. But for me, the multipliers were people who asked me to do hard things. And then we're okay watching me suffer a little bit. Um, you know, who stretched me? Uh, Ray Lane at Oracle was um, this leader who just asked me to do things that were irresponsibly hard above my abilities, above my pay grade. And then he never once bailed me out. He thanked me when I got it done, but he would watch from the sidelines. And in hindsight, I'm like, man, he asked me to do things at such a young age that I don't know that I have the courage to ask someone to do that. And, and I was asked, Ray, like when it wasn't just me, it was how he operated. I'm like, Ray, when you had members of your management team, these are executives who are running like $10 billion a year businesses. I said, when somebody was failing, why didn't you jump in and like, kind of like save them or do that job for them. I'm like, how did you not do that? He goes, Liz, you know the answer to that. I'm like, no, like I want to, I want to hear this. And he says, because that would be a failure of leadership. And for me, like the people who are multipliers for me were people who just in some ways showed me no mercy. They didn't coddle me. They didn't say, well, if you're having a hard time, just ask me and I'll do it for you. They're like, no, I need this from you. And I think you're bright. And so go. Now, some might want multipliers that are a little bit more on the safety side of that. But for me, the people who got the best out of me were like all stretch. I love that. How do you balance then, you know, if you have a really important project that that needs to be done correctly and and delivered correctly, how do you balance letting your team sort of experience that failure versus still delivering the product you need to deliver? Ooh, yeah, you know, for for me, I like to think about this as the difference between playgrounds and freeways. I, you know, I am coming, I'm joining here right from the heart of Silicon Valley, and one of the things that just bugs me about the Silicon Valley mentality, and it's seeped over into Silicon Slopes, is like fail, fail forward, fail fast, fail early, fail and learn, like fail, fail, fail. And I'm like, I don't really believe that at all. Like, and I don't think a lot of employees buy that either. Um, And there was a kind of a famous story at Oracle about uh, a tech support analyst who, when a customer called in to say that his production database had crashed, the tech support analyst responded with, oh, bummer, dude. (laughs) It's like, not a good answer. And it's like, you can't let like a a production database crash. Like that is not okay. But part of the job of a leader is letting people know where there are freeways, meaning it's actually not okay to fail here. Like you can make some little mistakes, but there are no big mistakes allowed here. This is where we have to sort of micromanage, get it right. Over here, these are places where we can experiment, take risks, try things, um, learn, you know, learn, make mistakes and recover. These are like playgrounds. And I think it's one of the most empowering things leaders can do is differentiate the freeways from the playgrounds. Cause it's naive to think that all of business is a bunch of playgrounds where we can just like learn how to do things. Not true. I think that can definitely be a hard thing to differentiate as, as a leader. Um, and in your book, you kind of talk about how leaders as they're learning um, will make mistakes and they will fail at times. Um, Is there ever a point when a leader is kind of creating that division between those playgrounds and those freeways um, and where they're admitting their mistakes and their failures that that could diminish um, their effectiveness as a leader? Mm. Well, you know, one of the reasons why I really uh, love Brene Brown and her work, and boy, if you don't know about it, you know, check it out, is I think she has changed our society. And she has, her work is on vulnerability and shame. And I think she's ushered in an era where you can be a strong leader and be vulnerable. Like, 
sort of back in my day when I was, you know, be, entering the workforce, like we still were operating under the assumption that leaders had to have the answers, be strong, have it figured out. It's like, you know, stiff upper lip kind of approach to leadership. But actually, like we want to work for people who are a little bit flawed and cracked. And, you know, if you think about the movies that you've loved and characters that you've most identified with, um, they're rarely these like perfect, strong, have it all together characters. Most of them, the people we root for in the movies, the people we identify with usually have some cracks in them. Like they're courageous, but yet they're vulnerable. And it actually strengthens us as leaders when we can let people know, like, I don't get it always right. I've made that mistake too. We found that the number one thing that encouraged people to take risks and innovate was not leaders declaring innovate, fail. It's not even like here are the playgrounds and the freeways. It's talking through your own mistakes. Oh yeah, I blew that once. Like I love to talk about the things I do wrong. And um, I have four kids and my two oldest are daughters. And like, I, I don't know, when they were growing up, I had this sense of like, I don't want them to think that their mom's got it figured out. I am a little bit of this like, toughen up and just, you know, get it done a little bit of pioneer spirit um, in my, my blood. But so I used to tell them about, oh yeah, I, I messed up like that too. I did once. And one time we were coming home from my mom's house and uh, my daughter, Amanda, she must've been, I don't know, seventh grade, eighth grade, something like that. She said, mom, you know, I've noticed grandma tells different stories about you than you tell. I'm like, oh, do tell. And I'm like, what's what's grandma doing talking out of turn? And there she's like, well, you know, grandma tells me stories about how like you did this good thing or you made this good decision or that you did. She's like, grandma tells stories about you being good. And first I'm like, oh, yes, because grandma doesn't know the stories about me being bad. Like I hid those from grandma. But actually I realized that I kind of aired on the side of like my stories about me to my kids were, yeah, I screwed this up because I wanted my girls in particular to know, like, I don't always have it together. I haven't always had it together and it's okay to not have it together. But when a leader does this with the team, it's liberating for the people around them. And it actually makes us like identify with these people. Like, Oh, you're like me. Cause I don't always have it together. I don't always have the answer to things. Uh, no, I, I love that. I, I think I'm the same way. I identify with leaders who are able to to point out their own mistakes and and have a sense of humor about things too. Um, and and so yeah, thanks for sharing that. And I think I don't think it. I don't know if it goes exactly with the with the talent magnet chapter, but certainly this would be a way to become a talent magnet. I think, and and so you know when you when you are a leader and you are a talent magnet, what's the best way as a leader to sort of recognize and appreciate those talents that other people have on your team? Hmm. Scott, do you want to start with this one? Because you're good at this. Well, what I've learned from Liz, this is a pithy phrase, but it's, it should haunt you like in a Jiminy Cricket way, in a good way. And that is as a leader, your job is not to be the genius but your job is to be the genius maker of others. And I've repeated this to myself countless thousands of times. So I think in a highly competitive world, especially in the Western hemisphere, but also in the Far East as well, is that you know, most organizations don't always uh, uh, promote you for your collaboration skills and for lifting other people up, right? I mean, you're either, you know, you're up or you're out in a lot of organizations. And so you're paid, you're promoted, the bonus pool is allocated to what your contribution is. What is the genius that you brought? At the end of the day, though, as Liz also will say, no one wants to work for the smartest person in the room. And although I have matured greatly under Liz's tutelage and her books, you know, I was the CMO of Franklin Covey for 10 years. I was an officer in the firm, public company, a lot of responsibility. The board and CEO had a lot of, um, a lot of trust in me. And at the end of the day, I thought my job was to be the genius in the room. I thought, you know, the buck stopped with me meant it kind of had to be my ideas. Well, the buck can still stop with you and you can still ignite people's genius. Colin, there used to be a phrase at Franklin Covey, best idea wins as long as it's Scott's. And it wasn't really a joke. And 
the more I came to realize that I, <laughs> I wasn't igniting people's genius. I was threatened by people that had a, you know, a better education than me, or perhaps had SEO expertise or, or, you know, Google Salesforce integration experts or new Marketo. I, I think I subconsciously hired people that I wasn't threatened by. Mm-hmm. And therefore, I did a disservice to our company and our culture and our clients and our shareholders. I was threatened by them. Honestly, this will sound convenient. It's true. It was reading multipliers that ignited in me the decision to step down as CMO. Not because I hadn't done a good job. I just realized that I needed to like refresh. I needed to reignite my own genius and allow others to lift up that I needed to become more mature and confident that my job was to be a talent magnet. My job was to recruit and retain people who were noticeably, palpably more educated and talented than me and to ignite their genius, not to hire people that I could control or manage or wouldn't eclipse me. And I'm kind of embarrassed to admit this was in my 40s, late 40s, better than your late 60s. But it was Liz's book that transformed my leadership style. I stepped aside from a significant career And here was the telltale point. I stepped aside from being CMO, and I physically did not walk back into the marketing department one year to give the new team their space. I left behind 40 people. I walked back in, and to my horror, Liz Wiseman, the emails, the websites, the postcards, the direct mail, everything was better. I walked in and said, oh, my gosh, this is like a better catalog. This is a better brochure. This is better. I was holding people back. I was not, not because I am a jerk always. I just thought I was the smartest and I wasn't. Yeah. And, you know, um, there's a comment in here from Samantha, such a great reflection, Scott, that really is a superpower that more leaders should have. Like, isn't everyone thinking that exact same thing? It's like, wouldn't it be great if all leaders were like Scott Miller, who said, yeah, like I, if I just focus on my genius or capability, it becomes a, a, a lid to the team. So this isn't unique to Scott. Like it would be the case with any person. And it's as part of this management maturity of you realize like, wait a minute, I have to do it myself because if other people do it, they're not going to do it as well. And then you get some proof that that's the case. And then you kind of mature a little bit as a leader and you're like, oh, well, they do it differently, but it's just as good. It's different, but just as good. And then you start to see, oh yeah, they do it differently. When I let go, and it's better. Now, Liz, will you, Liz, share the story about the attorney? It's the perfect time for that story. Oh, wow. Yeah, the attorney. So um, there was a, a partner in a law firm, and he had read multipliers. And, and he said, when I made a partner, and he said, I'm an attorney. So, like, by nature or training, I am like a diminisher, like we're micromanagers, we're perfectionists. Um, if any of you are like law in law school, like maybe you know this or, and, and he said, so I just knew that I would like uh, micromanage everyone. So this is when I became partner, I made a decision that I would only correct people's work if it was legally inaccurate. And he said, other than that, I just let those things go. And I focused on like using that perfectionism in the right places. And, and he said, it's like, kind of like, he's a great leader. Now people love working for him. Um, so I love Scott's perspective on this. Um, you know, for me, it's about, it's not about genius or genius maker. It's, it's about bringing So most, some people say like, Oh, I'm, I want to be a multiplier. It can't be about my own genius, like golly shucks. I'm just going to be like, you know, the, the genius watcher and the facilitator and, I'm like, no, no, being a multiplier is about using all of the intelligence available to you, which means the people who report to you, the people who don't report to you, but you need their help to get a good report and your own. So it's like, if you're not using all of your own intelligence, you're not doing it right. So it's not about suppressing yourself. It's about looking beyond yourself to get all of it. And and for me, it it comes down to asking a different question. And, you know, I have to admit, um, that, you know, there have been more than one occasion where I've been working with someone and I'm like, aha, and I start to ask like, is this person even smart? Now, there are probably other people who've been in situations with this. You're on a project team with someone and you're like, is there anything going on there? Like, am I working with a dumb dumb or is this person smart? 
and I'm assessing their smarts and I'm imagining like their SAT scores or their GPAs. And it always takes me down a bad path. So um, after I wrote the book, I gave it to a number of people before it was published and asked them to take like a challenge. And um, one woman said, you know what? I've got someone on my team. His name is Lokesh, who I'm just struggling with. And he just does not seem bright to me. And she said, I'm going to ask myself a different question. Instead of asking, is Lokesh smart? I'm going to ask, in what way is he smart? Well, like you can imagine this changes everything, truly everything. Because she says, two weeks. So every day I came into the office, like, in what way is Lokesh brilliant? And she's like, oh, he's brilliant at this. He's brilliant at that. And it's about not assessing people's genius like on some weird scale, it's saying, what is their genius? Like with the sense like, okay, not everyone in the world is a genius. Like we actually have a lot of data that shows that's the case. Um, watch YouTube fails um, and, and that'll, that'll help. But it's saying everyone comes with natural intelligence and capability. And your job as a leader is to, to find it. And so for me, that question that this, this um, early reader had really has helped me because I go into situations where I'm like, oh, I'm frustrated with this person's performance or apparent capability. And I just say, in what way is she brilliant? And let me find it. And I'm now you know, old enough and had enough experience in the workforce and managing to have figured out that it is way easier, way more productive, way more fun to figure out what people are good at and find a way to put it to use than to, to try to get people to be good at things they're not good at. Like that goes nowhere. That's a recipe for misery for everyone, particularly for the leader. So it's, I don't know, maybe I've learned this by desperation. I love that. Thank you both for sharing those insights and comments. I think that finding those um, genius and talents of each of those individuals within our organization and our groups is a really important skill that we can all develop as leaders. And like you said, that will help us find greater success. Um, within the past few months and past few years, um, with the situation with the COVID pandemic, we've seen a lot of good geniuses come out of that and lots of changes um, within our organizations. And the way that we structure our leadership. How have your principles from multipliers, um, how have you seen them applied through the pandemic and what changes um, have taken place because of that? Mm. Well, I think the pandemic has created new jobs for managers, um, including managing a remote workforce. And I think it's been in many ways, the ultimate diminisher versus multiplier test. Because all of a sudden you've got this world. I, I've been running a company where we've been working from home for, for years. Like, and I, I was struggled early on. Like we had an office and then suddenly people are working from home. I'm like, what are they doing? Are they working? Like, you know, are there like two-year-olds climbing up their legs? They're like, are, like, and so I went through my own struggle, but that was a decade or more ago, but now suddenly where managers have seen their team around a table, now everyone's gone and they're on tiles and some people are on camera, off camera. And, and I think it's been a really interesting test. Like, can, can you lead a team and get the most out of a team when you can't see them and what they're doing? And I think it has been a profound test for a lot of people. There's um, a CEO of a large tech company here in the Bay Area who he said, I was probably a little bit controlling and micromanaging. I wanted everyone in the office. But then when we're forced to go from home, he says, I realize that not only did people do work that was just as good, it was better. Like, and you, you give, give people more freedom, work the hours you want, you know, and it's given a lot more control into the work to the worker. And he's like, man, I wish I would have done this years ago. And this is a big software company here. Um, so this transition to remote, I think has been a proving ground for trust, which I believe is absolutely at the core of multiplier leadership. Um, it's also, I think, um, given managers this job that I think a lot of people weren't sure they ever wanted. So Scott, when you when you started in management, my guess is that 
your like focus was on like the professional in the workplace and you were not to be concerned with their home life. In fact, you probably weren't even encouraged to ask much about their home life. Like it's a little bit like um, out of scope. I was unpromoted from my first management role the first month I was put into it. So if that's a word, I was unpromoted because I thought my job as a manager was to turn the team into you know, versions of me, right? Just to replicate me. And like you said, try to make their talents my talents. Uh, I've learned so much uh, in the 30 years, Liz. I think, you know, regarding the pandemic conversation, this idea of FaceTime has been eliminated, right? All, all of us, you know, wouldn't dare come in after the boss or believe before the boss. We all now do what we have to do and do it, do it our own ways. So I think productivity has probably been exponentially in, improved. No one's watching me. No one's watching you anymore. You're you're bringing your best independently of your your leaders' you know, uh, work schedule themselves. I actually think, like you said, they, you know, we, we, you know, the carnage that the pandemic has wrecked on the world, it's notwithstanding. Crazy. To your point, Liz, it has reconfigured the future of work. I think in a very positive way. It's going to force leaders into a multiplier mindset to understand how do you build connection, how do you build culture? How do you build a culture where people choose a high level of engagement? Leaders can't create engagement. Yeah. You can't force someone to be engaged. You can force someone to be disengaged, but you can't force someone to be engaged. They have to choose that because of the kind of leader they're working with. And that may be a subtle, but it's profound. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to see when the story is written that the pandemic did wonders for ultimately separating bad leaders from good leaders, right? Yeah. And I think it's also given leaders new jobs, jobs we didn't necessarily sign up for. So back when I started in leadership, like you were in charge of people's professional life, but you were not in charge of people's personal life. In fact, you kind of stayed out of that. This is back in the area where you a little bit left, left your personal life at the door. You hung it up when you came into work. Some people didn't even want to talk about their personal life. Um, I'm probably someone who gets personal pretty quickly. But, you know, over the last couple of years, the job of manager has now expanded. And it's like, hey, team leader, guess what? You're now not only responsible for people's professional work, you're responsible for people's mental health and well-being as well. And I think a lot of managers are like, I don't know how to do that job. And I think the pandemic has thrust managers into, it's not just about getting the work done, it's making sure people are okay. And now we're dealing in a realm that's, I think, scary for a lot of people. Um, like, you know, we started our, with the beginning of the pandemic, we, we started our meetings with, um, it was something that we've always done every time we got together physically, but we just started every meeting with, how are you? Like, we call it check-in before diving in. and. It's just like, how are you? And I have to admit, I'm prone to just dive in. What's what's our task? Let's get to it. And so you're asking people, how are you? And some people are like, I'm not, I'm not doing great. In fact, I, I, I'm really doing poorly. And what do you do when you hear that and you're a leader? So like, this is a whole new area of how do you be a good kind of leader, a multiplier leader, when you really are now, I'm not saying responsible for people's well-being, but engaging in this, like the whole spectrum of people's life. And I don't think a lot of us have the skills to do this well. Yeah, Which I know is it's, oh, go ahead. Why, like Brene's work, I think is really important right now is like helping people see like. Wait, is she flaunting Brene's pre-release copy again that's signed? Is she, is, she, is she showing that on camera again, Colin? I might, I might be. I have a signed copy of Liz Wiseman's book. Does that matter at all? I know Liz Wiseman. Oh, I got I got copies of your books right over here. In fact, I can I flaunt Sorry. those? Colin, you've lost control again. I know. Oh my goodness. Um, no, I think we could probably talk about uh, about virtual work for for the next you know eight hours if we wanted to. Um, it's such an interesting topic, but um, I do want to I do want to touch on um, Liz's newest book, Impact Players, which Scott was just holding up there. Um, Liz you know, what was the writing process like for impact players compared to multipliers? Oh, it was far more miserable. 
um, you know, multipliers was so easy because I didn't know what I was doing. And, you know, um, people are like, when I was writing multipliers and releasing it, well, how many books do you want to sell? Do you hope it's a bestseller? I'm like, um, I hope someone other than my mom reads the book. That's what I hope. And I hope Jim Collins writes me a little like, well done, you know, Liz um, kind of note. And, you know, I didn't know that the book would, you know, be as um, like widespread and ubiquitous as it is. So like, I wrote it without any sense of pressure. Like I wrote it knowing like very much while I was working on it, like, Liz, don't write a bad book. Don't write a bad book. And Kerry Patterson, some people might know his work through Crucial Conversations. Um, I had interned for him. He's a sweet and dear mentor of mine. And when I first told him about the idea of multipliers, he was like, first of all, I'm mad that this wasn't my idea because it's such a great idea. And he's like, Liz, don't be stupid. And I think he probably literally said, don't be stupid because he knew what I was going to do. He's like, he says, don't be a first time author that just writes a book to get it done. He says, you go write a big book. He said, you write a New York Times bestseller. Like you give this every ounce of energy you have, like, do not disappoint me. And again, see, my multipliers are people like that who kind of kick me in the butt and say, you can, you can go bigger, do more. Um, so I was very much wanting to write a good book, but it didn't occur to me that anyone would like write a review or criticize it. So like your first book's kind of easy. Second book, you know, people are going to read it. And like, by the time I got to Impact Cars, I'm like, wow, what if it's a bad book? What if this is a stupid book? And so there's a whole like um, language you have to talk to yourself to get you to go keep working when it would be easy to just stop and call it done. So it was, um, it was a more difficult book for me. And it was also more difficult because, you know, I've always like taught to spoke to written to leaders. And this is a book to the, the up and coming leader and the sort of the leader within and to the contributor. And I'm like, yeah, no, those aren't, that's like not my people. Like I've had a lot of empathy for leaders. And so it was developing like a whole new set of empathy for the things that get in people's way of their ability to do work that really matters. Other than the boss, I have a lot of empathy on that. Can I chime in there, Colin? Absolutely. I'm gonna sound like a sycophant, but I, I am a huge fan of this book, Impact Players. I mean, truly, I mean, Liz should, Liz should be acknowledged for having this book hit the Wall Street Journal three weeks in a row. It's, it's a tough thing, right? I mean, the world is not, short now on business books coming out. Every business author was sitting home for the last two years writing a book and they're all coming out right now, right? And so Liz was able to cut through a lot of the competition and deservedly has this book be a Wall Street Journal bestselling book. I tell you, the book is a must purchase by every leader for every member of their team. This is a great book for graduating college students, people that are entering the workforce. They don't say this, don't say that, do this, don't do that. How to build your brand, your reputation. I think one of the most profound things I learned, um, I'll tell you, when I read Multipliers, I said, oh my gosh, I'm not, I need to become one. However, my humility stopped there. When I read this book, I said, oh my gosh, I am one. This book is a memoir of Scott Miller. So I'm not all about the deprecating humor. I am an impact player. And I'm very comfortable, confident saying, this is me. This was not me. So when I read this, however, Liz had so many tactical items, including this idea around drama. Like, you know, impact players, they minimize drama. They don't escalate it. It's one of the big areas in which I don't identify because I love drama. I love conflict. I love to kind of stoke the pot a little bit. And I think impact players are, are indispensable. You become indispensable when you are an impact player. You're the last person to get laid off. You're the first person to get promoted. You're the first person to get a new assignment. But one of the humbling aspects of Liz's book, one of the few things actually I didn't, I didn't um, identify with, but was transformative for me was to realize impact players de-escalate drama. They don't create it. It's an area that I'm learning because I do think an accurate assessment of me was, yeah, Scott likes drama. And it's something I've learned in this book to realize that I need to be working on de-escalating and minimizing drama, not fomenting it. Yeah, no, I love that. I mean, I, I, maybe we all like a little bit of drama, honestly, um, but no, that's great. And I'm, I'm excited to read Impact Players myself. Um, but now that we're, we're 
we have a few minutes left. We'd love to open this up to uh, to questions from the audience. Um, if people would like to come off mute, that's awesome, or or to drop messages in the chat, um, questions in the chat, we can certainly answer those as well. And feel free, you don't have to put a question in chat. You can just say something sassy even. It could be a compliment, yeah, I mean. Compliment. I have a question. Sorry, it's Samantha. Um, Scott, you mentioned um, one of the key things was to build a culture of trust, um, you know, with remote work. How does a leader create that culture when you are physically distant and, you know, only checking in a couple times a day? Like, where do you even start to build that culture? I think a couple of things. This may sound pithy, but again, I think it's valuable is in your mind, you do a couple of things. One is you check on. That's like a typical leadership skill, checking on people. And now it's about checking in. You're moving from checking on to checking in because people know when they're being checked on. And so I, one is ask yourself, am I checking in with someone? Are the questions that I'm asking, like, like Liz asked, you know, how is everyone doing? How are you doing? Making it comfortable for them to say, I'm not doing well, and then talk about it. You know, or for yourself saying, you know what? I'm not doing so well. It's been tough for me, right? So one is checking in versus checking on. Another is recognizing that as a leader, you probably don't know what it's like to work with you or for you. And so you want to build your self-awareness. What's it like to be in a two-hour Zoom call with me? What's it like to be on the end of a one-on-one -on -one meeting with me? And so to ask around, you know, what's it like to work with me and become much more self-aware about that. I think the great resignation isn't done. We know this, people are quitting bad leaders and corrupt cultures. They're not quitting jobs, they're quitting leaders. But they're fed up, they're tired of it. I also think another thing I'll say, which isn't necessarily Liz's content, but I can see Liz saying this, and I know it has some uh, you know, historical biblical reference, but this idea of the golden rule, bunk. Don't treat people how you want to be treated. The platinum rule, treat people how they want to be treated. Like Liz said, you know, all leaders shouldn't be consistent. That was profound if you missed that in the early part of this meeting. Is, you know, you don't want to be, you know, be flying off the handle, right? I mean, you want to be able to have, to regulate your emotions and things like that. But treat people how they want to be treated. You can treat people differently and still treat people fairly and equitably. Yeah, this I is what Scott, I had. A, I struggled with this one because I early in my career, I very much treated people and led people the way I wanted to be led. And the way I like to be led is, hey, Liz, we have a big job for you. It's over there. Go figure it out. Go do it. And we're over here if you need to check in. And so I would do that to other people. And they're like, what the heck? I feel like I was abandoned. Like you just gave me like the hardest mission and you dropped me in a foreign country and left me alone. And so I realized like, oh, that terrifies other people. And so I've had to really learn like, what does this person need and want and what is multiplying to them? And it's different than it is to me, to someone else. So yeah, I've learned that one the hard way. There's some, there some wounds that I have and other people have because of it. One of my favorite quotes from Liz is Liz will tell you that when she first uh, wrote multipliers, she was a bit concerned that she might be exposed as an axle diminisher. Like when, you know, when she on a radio program or a podcast and someone would call in and say, hey, Liz, it's Tim. Remember me? <laughs> that she would be exposed because part of her credibility comes from vulnerability, right? Is recognizing that she hasn't always been completely a multiplier. She kind of gave permission for you to own your Axel diminishing tendency, she named him. She does what Seth Godin does well. Liz and Seth share this. They name things so that you can address them. Because you can't address something and fix it if you can't name it, right? Is it the idea fountain? Is it the optimist, the pace setter, the rescuer, the protector, the perfectionist? And once Liz named these nine axle diminishing tendencies, I think it gave permission to people say, oh yeah, I do that and I do that and I do that and that and that. And now that since Liz has named them, she's given everybody permission to understand what that looks like and feels like to create more multiplying moments. I think Liz and Seth Godin share that uniquely as authors, as leadership authors. 
Love that. And I think we have time for maybe one more really quick question. Michaela, did you have your hand up there? I did. And awesome. I just wanted to ask Liz, um, being a student here at BYU and being impacted by definitely by the book multipliers and um, being excited to read impact players. I was curious um, if you could say in just a few words, like what do you know now after having done this research that you wish you would have known um, during your time as a university student? Mm. Well, I certainly wish I would have known when I started managing, like, it's not about you. It's not about you. And, and really, our school system does this. It very much creates this individualistic you, your performance, your grade, your contribution. You know, at best, our school system breeds impact players. And some of the traits that make someone an impact player make someone a really good leader. But some of them don't. Right, Scott, like that's kind of what Scott's story is. Like some of the things that make us amazing contributors where we're contributing value become barriers to being a good leader. And that's a thing that I wish I had figured out sooner. Fortunately, I did figure it out. And I remember like the lonely night where I realized, oh yeah, this isn't about me. Um, it's about what the team does around me. And it was a reorientation for me. Um, you know, I, I think there's something I learned at BYU that has really helped me. And I don't know if I learned it at BYU. Uh, like one of the things I learned at BYU was just, I, like this is really the only thing I remember from grad school. So those of you who are in grad school, like you're probably like keeping all your notes. I only remember one thing. And I remember, and it was Bonner Ritchie who kind of said it over and over, drilled it into my head that like the job of the leader is to manage ambiguity. And that has helped me so much in my career is like ambiguity isn't going away. And one of the things that the pandemic has really done for me is, you know, first I'm like, ah, shutting down of conferences as management. Like, that's what we do. We, you know, and, and the orientation was like, when is that going to go back to normal? And I've spent a lot more time thinking about, no, this is not going back to normal. Like, and it's not going to get clear around a new normal, it's going to be permanently chaotic and ambiguous and uncertain. And what I have to do is be comfortable in that uncertainty and help other people be uncomfortable in that uncertainty. And that in many ways is the essence of what impact players do is they're really good in that ambiguity. And, you know, the other thing that I think BYU really helped prepare me to do, and it, for me, it's not just BYU, it's service in the church as a lay church is this ability to go in and out of callings. You know, it's this kind of quirky thing about a calling is like you get called to do something you don't know how to do. And just the moment you finally get good at it and you know what you're doing and you're like, okay, finally, I like these little scouts or, you know, kids that I kind of hated, you know, like, oh, I really like them. Just when you decide you like it, they give you a different assignment. You're like, no, I want to stay doing that. Like, no, we have a new thing. I'm like, I don't like that either. Oh, guess what? I do like it now. And um, for those of you who've been on missions, you know, it's like, just when I'm like, finally figured out this area, I'm ripped out and sent to a new area. And, you know, you serve where you're needed at the time. And that service comes to an end. And you start somewhere else. And for me, it really helped orient me around, like, be a be a difference maker, not a position holder. And, and don't spend your time thinking about the position you hold in an organization. Think about the difference that you can make and being a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, being part of a lay church, like really helped create that sense of fluidity. It's like, don't get attached to things that don't matter. Like your job, your job title, you know, how many weeks you were on the, the best selling list, you know, I thank you, Scott, for the mention, but it's like, those are not the things that matter. Like just focus on making a difference. And, and that is BYU and church bread for me. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Thank you all thank you. for being here. All right. There we are. Thank you all for being here, especially thank you, Liz. That was incredible, uh, a great conversation. Um, thank you, Scott. 
Thank you so much for, for leading our club here at Book Club. And to Colin and Isabella, thank you both so much for moderating this. You both did a fantastic job. Um, so a, a special um, announcement for everyone here on the call. Um, you will receive an email later about this, but we'll, we'll be sending over a uh, free trial to you all to check out the conversation between Scott and Liz if you have not already watched it on Book Club, where they talk even more in depth than what you saw here. And also some other um, clubs um, as well with the Franklin Covey Book Club, where you will see um, the latest selection of Speed of Trust for November that just dropped the other day. So check that out. And again, thank you to everyone for being here. Thank you all for tuning in. And uh, we will see you next time. And this will be recorded. You can check it out on YouTube um, if you want to share it with friends. So thank you all. Thanks, James. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, thank everybody. You. Thank you to Isabel and Colin. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you so Isabella. much. Thank you.